Hey there, everybody. Pete Pardo here from Sea Tranquility. Welcome to another edition of Ranking the Albums. Today, we've got Stephen Reed with us once again, and he is a big fan and a kind of specialist on this band. So he's going to rank the catalog of the Wild Hearts, a band that probably for a lot of you here in the U.S. probably have maybe never heard. So now's a good time to get a little bit of insight onto the catalog of this uh, very popular band over there. Not so much here. So with that, I'm going to turn most of this episode over to Stephen. He's going to uh, run down the catalog for us and give him the ranking as he sees it. And uh, I'll provide a little color commentary here and there and ask some questions and things like that. So with that, Stephen, it's all yours. Welcome back, my friend. Thank you very much indeed, and thank you for having me, and thank you for allowing me to talk about the Wild Hearts. Um, I'm going to make no bones about it. There'll be people out there that know more than me about the band, but the Wild Hearts are a passion of mine, uh, and I make no bones about that. I make, I make no I make no smiley bones about that. That's who that's <laughs> we're winning. That's a smiley bone, okay? Um, the Wild Hearts have been a band that I've been into since 1993, which was their debut album. Um, they had done some stuff prior to that. Uh, Ginger Welter is the main man. He was in the Choir Boys for about 10 minutes before he was in the Wild Hearts. And he was in the, the Choir Boys for about 10 minutes because they couldn't cope with him, basically, in a variety of different ways. So I've got two 12-inch singles where he's on the cover. Looking suitably, I think the phrase we're looking for is wasted. Uh, and that was a theme at the time. So he then moved to America and joined the Throbs, who threw him out after a matter of minutes because they couldn't cope with him. Um, it's an interesting you know, track record we got going here. It's an interesting track record, and it's something that has followed the band in many different ways. And that's selling them out to be something awful and terrible, and they are, and they're not. They're awful and terrible in such a magnificent way. Um, and realistically, he started the Wild Hearts because what you realised was that the vision that he had, no band that he could join could have that vision. So there's a lack of compromise there, and I think that's been a theme of the band too, to their strength. Not always, but mostly to their strength. Uh, and initially he tried to get a singer in the band. So he had Snake, who was in Tobruk. Probably not many people have heard of Tobruk. They were a UK pomp rock band, nothing like the Wild Hearts at all. I've heard some demos, interesting. There was another guy that came in and kind of left very quickly. And realistically, Ginger Wildtap has been the singer in the band because he couldn't find the singer. And thankfully that gave us, in my opinion, one of Rock's best singers because he's just, you hear he's a Geordie, so he's from the north of England. That accent comes through in what he sings. Much longer before, it's very fashionable now, which is no bad thing for people to reveal the roots in their accent when they sing. But he was doing that way before it was kind of a little bit of a fad in a fashion. And I just think that he he tells stories. They're not always the stories that you would expect to hear because most of them are not particularly happy. Um, they're, they're not an, an upbeat band in that sense. But man, oh man, they are a heavy rock band. They're a punk band. They're a pop band. They're inspired by the 60s. They can be progressive. They can hit every nail on the head and they just do it fantastically well. Okay. I read somewhere that uh, the Wild Hearts were like the perfect combination of the Beatles, Metallica and the Sex Pistols. I think that's a very good description. It's a very <laughs> good description. You know, um, and I would add in moments there, let's say, and they sound nothing like them, but let's say Rush, okay, because they're a band who can be playing uh, a hook and a riff that you can get into and you can be jiving along with it and you know and boom they turn and they go up somewhere else and suddenly you're listening to a time signature that you can't keep up with that you can't quite cope with in your brain but you can still sing along with it and you still kind of get it and you look like a fool when you're at a concert because you're <laughs> dancing and you look, there's no beat but there's a, there is a beat and there's a rhythm and there's no rhythm and <laughs> I probably I think along with maybe Marillion there's another end of the spectrum the Wild Hearts are probably the band that I've seen more than anybody else. Wow. Certainly Ginger Wild Heart and the variety of different things that he's done from extreme metal and mutation right the way through to some solo acoustic stuff and then with the Wild Hearts. He's undoubtedly the artist that I've seen live more than any other. Wow. Um, you never know what you're going to get. Sometimes that implodes, but 99% of the time it explodes for all the right reasons. An mm -hmm. amazing live artist i have to say so and how many how many albums do they have in total they've only got eight albums hmm. okay so 
started in the early 90s, so only eight albums, and you've led me nicely on to the one of those bands. Now, the 90s was a strange time in the sense that lots of bands had lots of singles in the 90s. It's all about lots of singles, but it was about lots of the same single. So a band would release the same CD three times over for the same song. So you got copious amounts of B-sides, okay? So they would release a CD single, but you wouldn't get one CD single, you get CD1, CD2, CD3, a 7-inch single, and a 12-inch. So the Wild Hearts have got, now this is all official stuff that I'm not going to talk about tonight, okay? So you've got the debut EP, okay? So this is Mondo Akimbo Gogo. Then you've got the debut EP extended, remixed, because the mix on the debut wasn't great. That was called out in Kerrang, so they destroyed the offices, as you do. Um, so, you know, don't be happy, just worry. You can't talk about landmines and pantomimes. This is an unofficial one that's got some demos and various things that the band don't endorse. You should buy it because it's very good. <laughs> this is coupled with, this is just absolutely rammed with B-sides and songs that never made an album. They were just released in between an album and various things. It's also got a song title here that is three, three lines long, all on its own. Holy which smokes, says, wow. wow about the band itself because nothing is simple you've got riff after riff which is more b-sides and exclusive tracks and if you buy the japanese version riff after motherfucking riff then there's <laughs> even more stuff on that one you've got a covers album okay which is part of the official album's discography but it's not you've got the chutzpah which i'm going to pronounce badly and that's really bad because the first song on this tells you how to pronounce it okay so this is the Hootspit EP, which was bonus tracks and various things from different versions of that album. And then you've got the Diagnosis EP. So this is the newest thing that they've released, which came out about six seconds after the latest album, because when Ginger Wild Heart is having downtime to write songs, he writes songs. Okay, so that's what I'm not going to talk about. That's so a lot far. of stuff. That's a lot of stuff. So for huge Wild Hearts fans, and you do tend to find that they are utterly devoted to the band, they're that sort of band. You either love them or you love them. Um, and they'll look at what the, the albums and say, that's only half the story, but we're ranking the albums, so we're gonna rank the albums. Okay, so there's lots of great stuff there. If you hear anything out of this that you love, you can buy any of this quite safely. The band name may not thank you for all that because they don't agree with all these releases. There's more of that story to come. Okay, but where I'm gonna start, album number eight, and real fans of the band are probably going, oh, because I've chosen the obvious one to be bottom, okay? This is Endless Nameless. This came out in 1997. And this was the band's, well, I'm going to call it their fourth album. But in some people's eyes, it's their third album. That will become clear later on, okay? One word probably sums this album up, and they probably won't think of saying it, and that's drugs, okay? They were a shambles at this stage. They openly admit that, you know, the sound on this album basically hits you over the head. It's beyond aggressive. It's beyond heavy. It's distorted. I'll show you, do you know what? I've been very self-indulgent here, Peter, and I hope that, that you don't mind too much because I've got a huge pile of stuff to show people here because I <laughs> love this band, okay? <laughs> got to say, at the time, when you released a single at this stage, you released a single at this stage. So this is what you did. You released as many different versions as you could. You put different B-sides on them all. And you got and them all. Went and bought them all. I went and bought them all. <laughs> Honestly, this is only a, a, a portion of the Wild Hearts collection I've got that I'm going to show you here, okay? So you see the uncompromising artwork that's here. It's not pleasant. It's literally in your face. It's part of your face. But even more than that, you've got Urge. So that was Anthem. And this is Urge, okay? This tells you all you need to know about Ginger Wildheart. This is, this is, oh, this is where he was. This sums up his mind, I think, at this stage. So the band's guitarist is CJ Wildheart, but that's not CJ Wildheart on here. This is Jeff Streetfield that's on here, or Streetfield, how do you pronounce it? Um, because CJ had been ousted or left or who knows, but he's not in the band, they say they're not talking, they don't like each other. Um, and that, it's just, it took me years to work out that what's happening here 
is there are some great songs on here. Okay, so there is Anthem, there is Urge, there's Junkenstein, there's the cheerfully sounding Pissed Joy, okay? Um, and these are great songs wrapped up in an awful sound. And I must admit that I've been on it, yeah, I, I, but it was intentional. They knew, Ginger Welter knew what he was doing at this stage. Tells you a lot about the mental state, I would suggest, to be honest with you. I have been fortunate enough to interview him a couple of times, and the first time I was brave enough to ask would we ever version of this album that would sound a little bit less uncompromising? And his answer is he never looks back, so you don't go do that. He's kind of contradicted that a little bit with some recent stuff that's come out, but I get it. It's a snapshot in time. Life and the band were fully split up after this one. Um, and that, yes, yeah, it says a lot about where they were. So, good album, should have been a great album, but it's really not a great album, as to be said. When they play this stuff live now, it makes perfect sense. And that's what made me go back. And all, I mean, we're talking 1997, so we're 23 years down the line. I still struggle to get through this album in one sitting. Okay, so that, that tells you an awful lot about that band. Okay, it does, so, it does. Yeah, 2003, okay, so the band have split. Okay, they've reformed, and we've got the Wild Hearts might be destroyed. Okay, they do like to kind of play a little bit with some film type titles and various things like that. I quite like the, the artwork here. Yeah, I was going to say, it's a pretty cool poster that's on, on the go here. Pretty cool um, arm cover. Yeah, it is. it's a very, very smart one at that stage. Um, and it ranks quite low, in my opinion, because the Wild Hearts are a very diverse band. They, they don't just play the same song 10 times on an album. This is maybe as neat as they got to that. I mean, but I will temper that by saying that this is the three versions of Top of the World that came off this album. You're smiling away there, Peter. Yes, I, I spent a lot of my money on the Wild Heart stuff when I was younger. <laughs> a lot. And it hasn't really changed, to be honest with you. I still do if I can. Um, and this is still a staple of the live set. This is probably one of the best sing-alongs that you'll get at a show. It's also got on one of these, on this lovely pink one, it's got the, the best version of the Cheers theme tune from the sitcom that you'll ever hear. Okay, <laughs> so if you want an easy way into the band, something that you kind of know, kind of don't, give that a listen. It's genuinely a fantastic pop punk song, the way that they do it. But it's not throwaway. It's not just a gimmick. It's not just a silly thing that they're doing. But that, that album's also got... Vanilla Radio on it, and I would suggest that nine times out of ten, if you go see the Wild Hearts, they will play Vanilla Radio. So this is the album that's seventh for me. Danny McCormack, who is the band's probably best known bassist, they've had three bassists over the years. He started on this album, so these singles came out before Vanilla Radio, and there was a few other ones that came out beforehand, uh, and he plays on these, but by the time the album came out, he was gone. Um, and for a band who, shall we say, likes to be enhanced, okay, Danny was too much of a mess. They actually removed him from the band for his own safety, is kind of where we're at. Now he's back in the band, I'm <laughs> glad to say, and is in a much better place and is probably at the peak of his powers, I have to say, right now. So there's, there's This is almost like better than the Aerosmith story, I think. Oh, honestly, the, the, for me, if there's, and I, I should maybe try and do it one day and probably not do it justice, if there's one band that deserve a really proper book written about them, and Ginger Wilder has a book called Song and Words, which I haven't brought through to show, and it tells you just some of the stories about his life. So a lot to do with the Wild Hearts, a lot to do with his solo stuff, but the stories that are in this book, and I, I'm not going to go into it because I could lose the whole show talking about them, but it, honestly, you would imagine half of it's made up and none of it's made up. He did a recent tour, maybe four or five years ago. He did Song and Words. He stood up with uh, Jace Edwards from Wolfsbane, who does lots of production and various things for lots of guys. And they just, they played the back and track. They did some acoustic songs and he interspersed it with stories from his life. And it was like watching one of the best tragic comedians who also happened to be one of my favorite ever musicians for an evening. Outstanding. A total imagine. train wreck, but yet we as human beings are attracted to train wrecks, right? So Yeah, and often train wrecks are remarkably talented. So, yeah. so there you go. Go figure. So deeper cuts on this. So 
as I say, the end up as a three piece at this stage. So you've got ginger, you've got CJ, you've got steady, steady, S T I D I. So that's not just my pronunciation. That's <laughs> steady on drums. He had played long ago with the band. Um, but it kind of came and went. The drummer position is usually Rich Battersby, who's on the drums, but Steady's on that one. Nexus Icon, as I say, Vanilla Radio, So Into You, which is also a double single. There's lots of double singles. But of, but of course. <laughs> well, why would you not if you can? Um, great songs, but there's just not enough. If this was the only album, I'd tell you this was a great album. But compared to the rest of the catalogue, it doesn't quite tell the story. That's maybe the difference for me. There's right. still an awful lot more to know about the Wild Hearts than, than the three, four minute pop songs, pop punk rock songs that are on that album. Great though they are. Okay. And so from one extreme to the other. So at number six. Okay. So this is, this is the Wild Hearts album. So this is the Wild Hearts. Okay. So this is... That's the original UK release that we've got here. And we've got a Japanese version with some bonus tracks on it. We've got a raw version of studio, studio recordings, arguably a better sound and a better finish on that, arguably than what's on there. Ginger himself admitted going back to this, quite, this is quite a recent release. He kind of poo-pooed the idea. A lot of fans asked for it. He listened to it and went, yeah, okay, I'll put that out. They're maybe right. Um, but this is a more recent, this is a two disc version that brings together because he's such a prolific writer and he writes 99% of the songs for, for the band. It, it, there's a second disc of bonus tracks. This is not all from singles, although there obviously is a single. Um, and it's just, so this is quite recent. It's been remixed. Sounds phenomenal. And from one extreme to the other. So this is, let me see, I'm put, so much stuff I'll put them on my notes. Okay, this is more of the progressive side, I would say. There's barely a straightforward song in here. And then you've got the sweetest song, okay, which is possibly, it's almost the kitschiest thing they've done, but man, is it good. Do you know, it's, it's, a, it's a love song and it's sweet and it's beautiful. And it's sung by Scott Sorry, who was the bassist on this album. He was in Amen and A. Sorry, and Sinatra's has done some solo stuff. But most of this album is involved. It's quite progressive. You've got Rooting for the Bad Guy. You've got The New Flesh, which was a single I put there. Destroy All Monsters. This is a dark album, but not dark in the way that Endless Nameless was, where it feels a bit like a bottomless pit. And are you brave enough to just jump in and see if there's a bottom or not? This is a, an album that's going to take you on a journey. You may not end up in the same place as the band, to be fair. But man, oh man, is it good. But it takes a lot of work. This is quite difficult to get into. But that I quite like that side of the band. And it's a side of the band I don't think they always get credit for because in the 90s, they were on the charts. They were on top of the pops. Um, and they, they were a singles band to some extent. But then you bought the album and realised that they weren't that at all. Do you know, it's a bit like, to a lesser extent, and they sound totally different, but extreme but Extreme were a singles band and then people went and bought Pornography and your casual fans went, what is this? It's like, what I want more, more than words, right? What, what is yeah. all this stuff? Yeah. 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 Do you know, and the amount of people that I knew that bought albums by The Wild Hearts or Extreme who really weren't into that style of music and it just blew their mind. Do you know, I, th I thought they played of the acoustic things or in The Wild Hearts terms, Geordie in Wonderland, which was, I mean, we're on top of the pops playing with mandolins and various things like that. And that is a live staple as well. People sing along with that. And, but it represents that amount of the band, such a small amount of the band that it's unbelievable. So, sorry, I'm just, I'm going at such a pace. You can, you can tell how much I like this stuff, can't you? <laughs> Nobody's going to understand. The love is just oozing out of you, Stephen. I can oh, feel yeah, it. I can, I can feel it. Do you know, one of my favourite times is sitting in a car with some of my friends going to a concert when we're going to see the Wild Hearts because this part, there's always something to discuss. There's always a little bit of drama. There's always some phenomenal music. There's always something new. Ginger Wild Heart is always on social media. He's an interesting follow on Twitter, for example, because he's not shy with his opinions. I agree with some. I don't agree with quite a lot. It can be quite a hard follow because I love the guy to bits. 
I've met him at a couple of meet and greets and various things. He's just the nicest man in the world. And then you read some of the stuff he puts out there and you're like, hmm, do you know? So <laughs> there's, a, there's always a bit of love-hate with them in that sense. So number five, I'm at Hootspa, or should I say Hootspa, okay? Um, and this was from 2009. Uh, Scott Sorry, second with a band. Um, and this is just... A great set of songs here. There's some great uh, kind of pop songs on here. There's some great rock songs on here. But there's things like the, the Jackson Whites, which is a bit more involved. Um, there's Plastic Jeebus, which is obviously having a dig at a variety of different things. John of Violence, okay, so Low Energy Vortex. You took the sunshine from New York. You're not getting happiness and sweetness and light here, okay? But a song like You Took the Sunshine from New York, it's just a beautiful song, beautifully sung. So don't be put off by the titles. The title or the lyrics, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but the, but the lyrics, if you want to have someone in the modern rock world who's bearing his soul, 95% of what he writes is, uh, I think, is just straight from here. It's right out there. There's, there's very little hidden. He wants you to understand him. He doesn't always necessarily care if you like him. Um, and I, I think that's the quality. It is what it is. But he wraps it up in hooks. He wraps it up in choruses. He wraps it up with some great riffs. It can be heavy. It can be uncompromising. But it can be the most uplifting thing that you've ever heard. You know. So if you want to get into Hootspa, this is the brand new version. So as I say, Ginger never looks back unless he looks back. So this is, yeah, there's lots and lots of contradictions. So this is the Japanese version that I've got here. So the British version, the UK version of this has 10 songs on it. Then there's the Hootspa Junior EP that we saw earlier on. So the Japanese version, as they always do, the lucky Japanese always get bonus songs. So this has got 14 songs on it. Now my friend swears that the 10 song version is the one to go for. It's short and sharp. It's a classic 35, 40 minute long album. I prefer the Japanese version. I think the bonus tracks on here just fit in superbly. I think they add a bit different dynamic. There's a few that are a little bit more expansive. And I do like the throwaway one at the very start that tells you how to pronounce Hootspur, to be fair. So this version, which is a nice three disc version, brings yeah. it all up again with some demo stuff, some studio stuff. Um, and this has only just been out in the last couple of months. Uh, and this is, it's not been far away from my my CD player at, at any stage over that time because there's so much depth, so much to get excited about with it. I'll turn the page. <laughs> <laughs> As the old Bob Seger song goes, turn the page. Absolutely. Okay. Are we still with me here? Are we still with me here? We're okay. here. We're here. Such a place. Okay. So, if there's a way to make sure that your album doesn't get very much mainstream coverage, it's to call it Fuck. Okay, now, it is spelt. I'll put it down and get in the light there. It's a beautiful, beautiful velvet case here. Okay? Yeah, that's different. The wild parts like, they love the gimmick. This is a beautiful velvet case with the with embossed little, with, with the embossed fuck, for want of a better term of <laughs> phrase. And then inside you have uncompromising artwork like this. And this is a family show, Peter, so I won't open it. There you okay. go. <laughs> right. so this is officially the band's uh, second album, okay? Um, and there's a long story that goes with this, which I'll tie in a little bit later on. So this, to me, is the band's best album of short, sharp songs, okay? This was 1995. Now, this is, there's a theme developing here. The band are falling apart. Funny that, isn't it? So CJ, the guitarist, by this stage, he doesn't finish this album, but he sings on it, and him and Ginger singing together is the perfect combination. And Ginger has admitted on a few occasions that he, when CJ wasn't in the band, he looked for someone else that he could do the, the vocal harmonies with. They sing a lot of the songs in tandem a lot of the time, and he's never found anyone else that complements his voice quite in the way that CJ Weldhart does. The fact that the guy's a great guitarist too, they both are, just add something else to the pot. But thankfully CJ is on, his stamp is on most of this album, but he doesn't play on all of it, okay? But you've just got so much on here. So you've got, I want to go where the people go, right? So I'm just trying to see what I've got 
single wise here, there's so much stuff from this era. I may be better just showing it in, in one go. Um, you've got Justin Lust. So this was a Justin Lust single, okay? So for anyone interested, I'll try and do this properly. So that's Ginger. This is Ginger. Okay. This is Danny, so that's the bassist. This here is Rich Battersby. And this here is neither the guitarist that I'm talking about. I was okay, say. This, because <laughs> this is Mark Keds. Okay. Now, I don't know if anybody, anybody outside of the UK has heard of the Senseless Things. They were a kind of indie pop band. And Mark Keds, to a great extent, was the Senseless Things. Now, my brother was into them, and they had nothing to do musically with this band at all. So when he was announced as the Wild Hearts guitarist, I thought, hmm, interesting. And then he was gone again. So that, that really, I mean, I, I don't even think he plays on, on this fantastic thing that is here. There we go, lots of, I don't actually think he plays on, on, on this. Um, so, and that kind of said a lot about the band at, at the time. But, I mean, there's B-sides here, Sin and Sin. I could talk all day about the songs that are not on the albums. I promised myself I wouldn't do that. <laughs> not quite managing yet. Um, but there's stuff on, on, on the Fuck album uh, like Caprice, which is just a, a beautiful song. There's Jonesing for Jones, which is all about just a run, run of the mill rivalry of everyday life, which is a lot of, a lot of nonsense. Um, and then there's uh, Don't Worry About Me, which is a hidden track on the end of that album, which is just, I would sing it for you, but let, let's not. Um, it's just a little ditty, is what it is. And it's one of those little moments that a band do that's a little bit throwaway. It basically comes in at the album and fades out again. And you'll find that at every Wild Hearts show, that song is sung by the crowd when the band are not playing it. Wow. It's one of those moments where when they go off for the encore, the, there's the cheering and there's the clapping. And as always happens, there's that little lull where people kind of get bored and wait for the band to come back. And then it usually builds. Well, it gets filled with that song. It gets filled with Don't Worry About I always it. thought, wouldn't it be more interesting at a concert when you're waiting for the band to come out for the encore to actually everybody sing something in unison, rather everybody sit there and stamp their feet and clap or whatever. I mean, it's just like, let's find something well, that's kind of cool to do. And, that, and there you have and it right there. The do, and you'll find that they come out and they play the encore. And as the crowd leave, they sing Don't Worry About Me. And it's a great moment. It's one of those things where the whole room is together. You know, you've had a great night, you're leaving a sweaty venue, you've been really entertained, and everybody is still singing the same song. And it's a, it's, but it's one of those, it was just a throwaway moment at the end of the album. It's a bonus track, it's not listed. It's just a, a great moment, as to be said. So that's album number four. So we're already well on our way here. Album number three is, I'm trying not to get too much light on these. This is The Renaissance yeah. Men. Okay, so this was my album of 2019. I made no bones about it. I love the Wild Hearts. I see their shortcomings sometimes. I do understand that. But this is, they hadn't had an album for, I want to say it was 10 years after Hootspur, okay, and 24 years since Ginger, CJ, Rich, and Danny recorded together. There was no reason for this album to be as utterly outstanding as it is. It just, it makes no sense for a band that hadn't been recording together. They played a lot of shows. Danny had only recently come back into the band. He was in a band called The Main Grains. He'd had his leg amputated um, through misdemeanors and various things and all that that led to. Um, and he was opening some of the shows with his band The Main Grains, which for a fan, what a great night. You go and see the, you know, not the original bassist, but you go and see the bassist that you grew up watching with his band, who is famous for vomiting every show because of nerves. Okay, all the little nuances of a lovely band like the Wild Hearts. Um, and then you knew, you just knew that he was going to come out for the encores, and he did. And it just grew from there, and he rejoined the band. And there's been some ups and downs since. There, I think there's always going to be some ups and downs with the Wild Hearts. Yeah, like it. Yeah. He had some stressful moments where he didn't quite finish a show and various things, but he's obviously had an awful lot go on uh, in his life over that period of time. But they seem to be on a roll again. Um, as I say, the Diagnosis EP and the Renaissance Men, that's the band's most recent releases, just phenomenally good. I mean, this is a six-song EP. 
that came out just after the album, you would imagine that this is, you know, the stuff that was left over and throw away. No, no, these were freshly written after the release of the album. And there's everything on here is everything as good as what's on here. And, and that's incredible is what it is. And that's what the Wild Arts have consistently done over the years. There's nothing about them that was throw away um, and it wasn't thought through. So there's, on Renaissance Men, you've got songs like uh, Dislocated, and that's shown still even now that Ginger and his band feel dislocated from the rest of the world. I just, just doesn't fit in with modern day life, I think it is the answer to it more than anything else, but I think that's a willful decision. Not necessarily the wrong decision either, but let's not go down that road. There's songs <laughs> like Let Em Go, which I, I knew as soon as I heard it that that was going to be one of the songs that when they played it live, the whole place would just come alive, and it does. Diagnosis, which is a song about mental health issues. Ginger suffers. He is very vocal about it in a very positive way. He wants to use his experiences to try and help others. Um, he's had a couple of charity singles with Ryan Hamilton and, and various things like that. He doesn't shy away from it. Sometimes, as I say, that makes following him as a fan quite difficult, but so it should be because that's who he is. And, and, and it's, it's a demon he carries all the time. And, and he isn't embarrassed about it and he shouldn't be because it is who he is. But also on the newest one, Renaissance Men, CJ writes a song, Little Flower, that's quite unusual. So that's a little nuance there for a fan like me. How would that work? Because he's got some solo stuff and it sounds a bit like the solo stuff. Sounds a bit like the Wild Hearts. Um, and it was just a joy for me. It was an absolute joy for a band that I've been quite devoted to for a long, long time to come out with an album, and out of the blue, really, no one really expected an album from them. I kind of thought what we were going to get was a tour every year or every two years, anniversaries of albums and various things and great events that they were putting together. And then the album was announced, and I remember a few of my mates immediately were on, were on the phones. Are you excited? Are you worried? What do you think? And we were all excited, and we were all worried, and we all love it. Every one of us. There's not one dissenting voice that says this is not a great Wild Hearts album. It is a great Wild Hearts album. You keep your expectations somewhat low and then you're pleasantly surprised. That's a good thing. Absolutely. Absolutely. <clears throat> so we've got a top two. Okay. Top and two. anyone that followed the band will know that I'm going right back to the start with both. Okay. Now bear with me here. Okay. Because number two is not Fishing for Luckies. Okay. It's also not Fishing for Luckies, okay? It's also not Fishing for More Luckies, okay? And it's also not, no it is, it's Fishing for Luckies, okay? Now the story behind Fishing for Luckies is that what the band wanted to do with their second album, and if ever there was proof that record labels know absolutely nothing, East West was the label here, man oh man did they not get on well, okay? They wanted to release a double album, okay? So they wanted to release all of these songs together. So this to me is their best album of short, in your face songs. Okay, they play a lot of these songs live, Nita Nitro and various things like that, all go down superbly well. This is our best collection of long, involved, progressive, heavy, punk, everything songs. Everything's on here. There's also some sing-alongs, Jordi and Wonderland that we're on top of the pops with, that's on here too. You put those two together, and I would have to guess that you have one of the best double albums that's ever been released. And the record. Oh, so you so because my first instinct was to say you put them together because the songs are all so different that it wouldn't work. But you're saying oh, it no. actually would make a great album then. Okay, it would make a phenomenal album. And the record company just said no, not doing that. You know, it's only a second album. We well, what year was that again? So we're going back to 1994. Yeah, I mean, double album in 1994. Yeah, that's that's yeah. not happening. Yeah. A, a massive step. I do wonder, though, if being as brave as that might actually have been enough to make them huge. Now, I'm biased, okay? I, I know I'm biased. You can tell I'm biased. I can't hide how much I love this band. But every song on Fishing for Luckies, and this, this ended up coming out prior to this. This was a fan club only album, okay? And you had to go and buy the single, okay, which had information on how to buy this from the fan club and therefore it kind of got lost along the way 
And there's songs on here like Inglorious, If Life Is Like A Love Bank, I Want An Overdraft. So you've got, you know, that's that song, that's this single that I'm just showing you. That's that one there. Um, you've got Schizophonic, Do The Channel Bop, Geordie In Wonderland that I've mentioned a few times, and Sky Babies, which is 11 minutes and 24 seconds long. Now this is a band who were on their debut kind of known for their kind of punk sort of rock sort of motorhead kind of as you say sex pistols and metallica and the beatles i mean you can actually sing a line from a uh, day tripper on the debut album because it's in there so mm -hmm. that's the sort of thing that they were doing and then you've got an 11 minute long song in here but it's just it's catchy you can sing along with it but you can't keep the beat to it there are repetitive moments on there that however many years we are down the line how long 26 years I still have to count in my head to make sure I come out at the right point because but they can play the stuff live. Do you know, it's just incredible that a band who were willfully such a mess were just so good. Do you know, so put these two together and you have a phenomenal album. And what record labels do is they, get, they, they latch on far too late. So the record label put this out. But they understood that the fans already had this. So what they then did was they put a whole load of different stuff on there. So you've got In Like Flynn, you've got Mood Swings and Roundabouts. These are good songs. The band didn't like this. The band said, that that's, this isn't an album. It, it's not this. It's not that. It's not that. What is this? So they actively went out and encouraged their fans not to buy the record that the record label put out. It's not the best strategy, is it, really? No, not at all, no. Um, uh, and it was writing on the wall and all of that sort of stuff you just knew that they were never going to get on they were difficult at the best of times anyway because they were enhanced quite a lot um but it was just as a fan it was a phenomenal thing to follow do you know i, I saw them very early on they were second on a bill there was a band called curb dog who opened to probably should be much bigger than they ever were then there was the wild hearts and then there was the almighty and it was a really diverse but good bill all of the bands made sense with each other without sounding like each other and the wild hearts and i like the almighty i love ricky warwick i like black star riders the wild hearts were head and shoulders above anything else on that bill because the level of musicianship in the band and they don't need to show it off it's not about how can i play it's not about how good am i it's about here's a great song I just happen to be very good at adding little bits here and little bits there and most of it until you sit down with a pair of headphones on, you don't even notice it's there. Mm. And then when you do notice it there, you think, wow, that's just utterly amazing, you know? So, there you are. So, and I did say that I wasn't going to talk about anything that wasn't on albums. Well, Peter, I, I, I'm a liar, okay? I, I can't <laughs> I'm a liar because I've got to show you things like Sick of Drugs. I mean... This is a song that's played live probably most times that they play. It's not on an album, it's just a single. It is on albums because there's so many compilations and so many various things. I'm not going to take this out of the sleeve and there's a reason for that. This here, this is grass. Right, I'm not telling you what grass it is, but this is grass, okay, behind here. Wow. Right, I'll show you the back, maybe that'll give you a better idea. It's on a kind of furry mat, okay, and underneath the uncompromising sticker, I used to have a t-shirt with about 30 of them on the front nobody would talk to me when I wore that t-shirt definitely not my mum she does have nothing to do with it at all but in the grass actually if you'd let it grow it grows into sick of drugs and this was the sort of band that they were and the label were kind of helping them out I suppose too, to be fair because I mean who else was doing that nobody was doing that so they were great fun to follow great fun to spend all your money on and I mean yeah, literally all your money, all your money. <laughs> yeah, I mean I mean, I've, I'd, I'd put so much out to show people, you know, because I've got red light, green light, which was famous for its video, because the video is literally two light bulbs, one red, one green, and it just goes red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green for the entire song, <laughs> you know, and they wonder why they didn't get this stuff shown, you know, I mean, they've, re they've recorded videos that were so pornographic that you can't show them on the television, so what was the point in that? They did lovely, that's Vanilla Radio, they did lovely picture discs and, and various things like that. I've got some promo stuff that's got Clawfinger on the B side. Loads and loads of different stuff. And then you get to album number one, and it's the debut album. Came out yeah. in, as it says, 1993. I very nearly wore my 1993 t-shirt, but you know, I'm not a sellout. It's new, 
So I decided, no, I'll put on a classic concert one from an actual gig from 1990 and about there, somewhere like that. This is, couldn't ever have been better titled. This is Earth versus the Wild Hearts. And it always has been, and it always will be, and the Wild Hearts will always be versus the Earth. But every single song on this album is just astounding. It's just phenomenal. I mean, what artwork to put on your debut album? I mean, how to put people off? Do you know? I mean, he's and Ginger Welter posed in that oil with that horrible thing on his face for I don't know how long to get that phenomenal in his eyes shot on there. And I saw this. I guess he felt he felt very strongly about it. He, evidently, he did. Evidently, he did. Um, and I remember seeing this in the shops and looking at it and going, "That looks terrible. Why would I buy that?" And then I bought. A magazine which was so unimaginatively titled called Rock CD and it only lasted for about 10, 15, 20 issues and the whole idea was that there was a CD on the front and every article in the magazine covered one of the bands that was on the CD and on that CD was Love Shit, okay, there, there's a catchy title for you, okay, and I cannot tell you how often that I played that song, I can't tell you anything else that's on that CD, I have no idea what other bands are there, Nothing else stuck with me. Nothing else got played. I just played that song over and over and over and over until I thought, well, all I just have shit. to go and, and buy all this. So I, I went and bought Earth vs. the Wild Hearts and from the lovely brown vinyl of Greetings from Shitsville, which <laughs> opens the album. Yeah, you know, and it's a brown vinyl, you know, and it's got the fly because we all know what the brown is, okay? Because the b is called The Bullshit Goes On. Uh, you know, they're, they're wrapping nothing up here, you know? And then they had the TV EP. So this has got TV Tan off the album off it. It's got Show a Little Emotion, Danger Lust. Down on London. We're down on London because we're not happy. We don't like anything. Okay. That looks a bit like a pizza box. Because what's inside the pizza box, okay, and, and if you're a little bit squeamish, if you I'll apologize now, that's what's inside the pizza box. It's Alrighty. not nice, it's not pleasant. And this is a picture disc, okay. So yes, that pizza has spun around on my record player. I mean and the back's even got fake grease on it, you know. It's just when you're that age and you don't like the world very much and you've got a band dislike the world this much, you're going to love them, do you know? You're going to love them. <laughs> then they had Sucker Punch, okay? Now, if ever a band did a Motorhead song better than Motorhead, it's Sucker Punch. It, it segues in from the beautifully titled My Baby is a Head Fuck, Okay. And that one, it, just as it's starting to do that thing that you think, please don't fade out, don't fade out, this drum a salvo kicks in. And it comes in at such a pace. And you know that if you're down the front at a gig and that sucker punch drums comes in, you're going to be bleeding by the end of it, do you know? Because <laughs> the whole place just goes wild. They are the wild hearts after all. And it's just outstanding. But interestingly, 29 Times the Pain, it's track number four on the back of a 10-inch single, which one side is etched, but I won't take it out because I'm boring everyone to death by now, um, is actually what they close most of their shows with. So they close most of their shows with a B-side. And that shows you that this band never wrote songs and thought, meh, that'll do, we'll stick it on the B-side. Maybe to their detriment, because some of their best songs are not on their albums, and these albums are fantastic, you know? And that was just an odd move. Brave move, because then you've got Caffeine Bomb. This was a single that wasn't on this album, but then they re-released this album with the single on it. Of course. Okay, and obviously, you would release it as a, as a vomit green <laughs> picture disc, do you know? Um, I mean, th this is a, a band, I mean, is this the one that's got it on? It does. Now, obviously, there's been a bit of profanity in this video, okay? But I do love the title of track three. Okay, the track three is called Shut Your Fucking Mouth and Use Your Fucking Brain. Okay, now those are the only words in that song. Okay. And actually that statement which will go very well in 2020. Yes, absolutely. And that, those are the only lines in that song. And you just sing them over, over and, over, and over and over. And the warning sticker on the front says, the Wild Hearts, Caffeine Bomb, 
warning contains language that you'll use every day, but you may be offended that we do too. Okay, <laughs> and that, that sums the wild hearts up. They're offensive, but they're offensive in such a way that everybody is offensive. They, they see the world, they know the world, they understand the world. They like to say greetings from Shitsville. They love you till they don't. They're drinking about life. They have a sucker punch. They've got the news of the world. They talk about the, the miles away girl. They talk about life. Earth versus the wild hearts. This Number is one. unashamedly. If somebody asks me, and you can you can see it on my little profile bit on, on the website. If somebody asks me what top five favorite albums, this will always be there. And it will never move. And I can tell you that now, this will never move. This album has been on the journey with me. It's been part of my life, continues to be part of my life. They played the whole thing live just a couple of years ago when there was the anniversary of the album. It was quite emotional. It was fantastic. Uh, I have no qualms in telling everybody who already knows if they've stuck it out this long. No idea how long I've been talking, far too long. I love the Wild Hearts. Okay. And that's, that's all there that's is. That's going to be the title of this video. Scooby <laughs> Reed loves the Wild Hearts, right? <laughs> <laughs> well, they sound like the ultimate rebel band. So, um, and I would urge any of you who are, who are watching and who've been watching the whole video who perhaps have never heard the Wild Hearts before to go out and investigate their catalog. But more importantly, I know Stephen is going to check the comments section uh, once the video is live. If you have any comments or questions for Stephen, put them in the, the comments section and he'll, I'm yeah. sure he'll be happy to go in and answer any of them. Because he, he sounds yeah. like he knows a lot, of, just, just a little bit about the Wild Hearts. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, I quite, as I say, honestly, I could probably do the same amount again showing you different things from through their different EPs, different versions of releases. This this was the whittled down version and I haven't I still haven't showed everybody everything that's gathered round about me. So yeah. It's always great when I have folks on the on the show. Uh, it reminds me of about a year ago. I had Chris Allow on the show with me. I mean, Chris has been on a few times also, uh, but Chris is like next to myself, like the biggest Black Sabbath fan I know. And no, Chris dude. and I did like we were originally going to do like a forty minute history of Black Sabbath show. It turned out to like a three hour three part extravaganza because. We just, took, we both live and love Sabbath so much. And Chris bought all, like, he had all these kind of cool, like, memorabilia things, like tour booklets and shirts and signed albums and EPs and all this stuff because all that stuff is out there. And if you love a band, as Stephen yeah. just showed you, you're going to go out and buy, like, everything they put out, right? So uh, so this is nothing new, So, but this is, this is cool. So yeah. thanks I mean, so much for sharing. More. This has been so much fun. I have spent the best part of two weeks kind of going through – we listen to albums that I know inside out that, I mean, I'm sure somebody somewhere will say I'm about to have made a mistake along the way because that's been an awful lot of talking. I mean, I've written <laughs> notes upon notes upon notes. I've not even said half of what's actually written down. Um, but yeah, it's, this has been so much fun. See, having the opportunity to talk about a band that just means so much to you. They actually talking about them it makes me realize they probably mean even more to me than I realized. So, uh, yeah, probably. I mean, it, it's, yeah, uh, it's I, quite obvious. It's quite yeah. obvious. I think so. with a lot of music that we listen to, I think some things you take for granted just how important it's been at certain points of your life. And yeah. the Wild Hearts have been that band for me, you know, along with others, not, not oh, just yeah. the Wild Well, we all but, have them, right? We all have yeah. them. It's, it's, it's natural. So, yeah. so cool. Well, thanks again, Stephen. We appreciate it. So remember, everybody, if you're watching, uh, you have any questions for Stephen about the Wild Hearts, uh, especially you folks in the U.S., who I'm sure this is going to be a kind of a newish band that you maybe have always heard about but never listened to, Stephen will surely go in and answer any questions. And also, don't forget to visit both of our work on www.seeyourtranquility.org. Of course, we're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, here we're on YouTube all the damn time. Steven's coming back. We're going to count down our 10 favorite songs for uh, Swedish hard rockers Europe. So you don't want to miss that. So stay tuned. Thanks again, everybody. Steven, we'll see you soon, my friend.